direction is migrating to the new generation and if you're looking at the new generation there's different type of migration that we're going to see the different type of application that we come across and it can be anywhere from a service provider from an end user from a utility point of view we've seen a lot of different applications that are still using tdm if it's simple business application uh, like you know uh, over old traffic interfaces uh, you have an OC3 or an OC12 interface that's still running it. Uh, voice trunking for DS1s uh, or below. Third-party list lines. Uh, because of the security level of the TDM, we still see those around. Um, digital cross-connect and ADM replacement. Those things are still out there and they're still running. And we see a requirement to start replacing them, which is kind of counterintuitive to the direction that the market is going. But... We'll address that one at the second uh, part of this uh, uh, section. And of course, uh, for utility, the SCADA backhaul, the old uh, two-wire, four-wire, RS-232, and so on, that we still see a need for them based on the type of interface they have. Now, why do we see the need to replace a part of the um, problem and not actually replace the entire services? Again, usually it's because difficulties to justify the cost or the operation or the outage that it would take to do that one will be too large so we see different customers approach it and try to modernize either part of the network or different islands of the network in order to get a better utilization of the network without the downtime or without the cost to replace everything with the new service so the different types of modernization, uh, as we've seen, um, they go from simple to complicated, and each one of them has its pluses and minuses. The most simple one that we've seen is using OTN. OTN, Optical Transport Networks, basically it's a next generation sonnet. It's sonnet on steroids. It's still a TDM technology, but it can go all the way up to 400, 800 and above uh, gig on the line side, which gives you the ability to take the old legacy interfaces and plug them into a new core. And that gives you ability to cap the existing services, but you can add additional new services because you have the additional capacity. So it gives you kind of a cap and grow, but at the same time, uh, it provides you the ability to add new services as needed. The other one that we've seen a lot is basically the WDM, um, especially for um, users that don't have uh, a lot of fibers. If they're not fiber rich, if they are limited to one or two pairs of fibers, DWDM actually provide a very good solution. You basically uh, take that pair of fiber, move the existing sonnet over DWDM, and now you can actually deploy in parallel additional uh, services. So far, those two solutions are cap and grow. In other words, you still use your, your existing uh, sonnet, but you just move it aside in order to enable new services. In addition to that, we've seen the migration of actual the transport devices going from native TDM into circuit emulated solutions. And depends on the speed and the interface, it can go SES, it can go SEP, and there's different way of looking at it, depends on the KPI that the services are needed. Most common requirements from customers is to be ready for next generation services. Um, they usually don't just want to maintain the existing services. They need the extra capacity or the extra feature set that the new generation of transport will bring to the table. So if we're looking where we are and where we want to go, this is kind of a simple, simplified modeling with the pros and cons of each one of them. So if we're looking at the current situation, if you have a low order sonnet that takes, you know, DS1, DS3 and above, Usually it connects to a high order or there can be in the same unit itself. And then you have the OC1 and T2 running the traffic. As I said, the first two options we talked about are mainly the cap and grow. So you can actually put an OTN or DWDM high order that will take the OC48. It can go even lower. I mean, usually OC48 is 2.5 gig. It makes sense at that point to start aggregating them into 10 gig and above. But we can even take anything like an OC3 or an OC3. As long as it's optical, the OTN will take that one, not a problem. It's simple, it's easy, 
the main problem that you see with that one is the low order sonnet still needs to be there and you still have the problem with you know maintaining it and supporting it option two is of course running um all the low orders as circuit emulated directly over us uh, uh an ethernet device and at that point the connectivity can go directly into a higher rate switch or it can be a combination of one and two and the higher rate switch can already uh, connect with a uh, dwdm interfaces so that 100 gig or 400 gig e can already come out as a channel in a dwdm interface or even an otn transport so all those things we've seen each one of them has its you know pros and cons each one of them has a little bit different uh, approach to it uh, and each customer is different so based on what is your need and growth requirements um, a different solution can work for you so looking at the different application the most common one and again because of the time uh, i kind of um, concentrated into three main applications usually what we see as the main application is the voice backhaul. You still have those uh, voice connection to the tandem switch, to your uh, local uh, exchange, to you know, going to the main service provider to provide the connectivity, and those still are using DS1, you know, DS3, OC3, and above. But the connectivity in between is, you know getting to be a problematic especially if you're getting it from a third party uh if you or if you have your own network it just cannot scale to the to support the additional new services so because of that the simplest way to move that one would be to go into a uh, assess solution a circuit emulation solution and at that point you can take the ds1s the ds3s any one of those connections and put it over a standard ethernet backbone uh, there's different technology to do that one we're going to get to that one and then basically provide yourself, uh, you know, um, a virtual connection all the way to the other side and provide the same level of connectivity, the same level of SLAs, and the client will still uh, behave the same and provide the same. So that's on the voice side. That's where we see the majority of the TDM interfaces. However, as I said before, we also see uh, different enterprises that have least line for a specific capacity uh, because of security reasons, because of the fact that you know they're less prone to hacking and they're not routable services. Uh, also, because TDM by nature is a constant bit rate, um, they have no problem, even if they don't use it or use it, uh, the capacity is there always for them. So we've seen in the past a lot of service provider phasing out their TDM offering and provide Ethernet solution instead. With this one, um, by providing a CES or a circuit emulated termination point, you can provide the same quality of service of TDM and the interface to the end customer is still gonna be TDM while the main core is gonna be basically Ethernet or MPLS. The third application is mainly for utilities, uh, SCADA or low speed interface connection. Uh, if you're looking at the legacy RS-232, V35, 2R, 4-wire, even 37.94 for teleprotection. All of those things, um, we can provide a solution by converting them as circuit emulated um, features. And then each one of them has a different level of uh, requirements, KPIs, SLAs, that we need to address as part of the provisioning stage. But basically, they follow the same concept as the first two applications with circuit emulation. So I'll start at the lower end, basically, from um, the SES application or the subrate. Uh, you need to understand what part of services and what kind of KPIs those services need. And at that point, you can select if you're looking at OC level and above. SEP can be a solution. It's more transparent. It can provide you more solutions. Um, if you're looking to do DS3, DS1, or any of those features, you can also use SES. Um, each one of them will give you a different level. Uh, SES is more transparent than, sorry, SEP is more transparent than SES. Each one of them will give you a different set of feature set based on the need. Then the solution, the second part is to select the transport medium. Are you going to run SES over Ethernet, SES over IP, or SES over MPLS? Each one of them provides, and that mainly depends on the transport medium, if you own it or you provide or you get it as a service and last one 
when you configure the services, are you going to use a, a setup or use SES over PSN? Setup is mainly used for any services that don't need to be aware of the underlying um, structure of the DS1s, basically DS0 level. If you don't need that one, setup would be more than satisfying. SAS over PSN gives you the ability uh, to work with individual uh, time slot. And at that point, you can actually manipulate them, uh, groom them, and provide additional functions. Um, depends on the infrastructure and where you're going. Um, we're going to see different type of services and watch each one of them can provide you, you know, SLA level, latency, jitter, uh, projection switching. I'm going to touch it a little bit. Um, the second part of this uh, section is going to be provided by Jack, and he's going to talk about a little bit about the restoration protection and the feature set of each one of them. And that, of course, dovetails into the technologies that we're using, uh, MPLS-TP, IP MPLS with RSVPTE, or segment routing with traffic engineering. Each one of those has its own um, inherited benefits and, of course, um, features that they are better at or not as good at. So looking at the migration path. So there's a number of different ways to look at it. I'm kind of simplifying the solution here. So when you look at that one, the easiest way to provide is, again, if you have a secondary pair of fiber, you can set it up and run it. If you don't, DWDM is an, always an option, so you can run uh, a DWDM connection between the Sonnet Max um, in order to release a, a second pair of fiber or another wavelength to provide a secondary connection. At that point, you take a native packet transport device that work on that secondary pair of fiber or secondary lambda, bring it up, check the connectivity, and the easiest way to do is basically connect the Sonnet Max directly into it. If it's a, you know, end time DS3, like a, you know, like a, an aggregation or, um, you know, uh, a utility max or an M13 or even a, a, um, a channel bank. So you take that T1, you can take that one OC3, you can take the OC12 or any one of those connections that comes out of the, of the max and basically feed it directly into the native, the native packet transport and at that point, it will do the connectivity. Once that app, you can disconnect the Sonnet connectivity. Uh, most of the cases, the Sonnet works either in a ring or it works as one plus one. So at this point, you can move the working, make sure that it's up, remove the, prote the protection, and then move the protection back into the native packet transport. And at that point, you can remove all the services. So that's the first step or the easy step. Um, it's fast. It's relatively I would say minimal to no downtime. And the next step is actually moving the actual services. So if the intention is to actually move the Sonnet Max uh, or the ADM out of service, because that's the problem of the sparing and level of expertise, you can um, get a native packet transport that supports all those interfaces directly and prove them over ethernet. And at that point, in addition to that link that connects the Sonnet Max to the native packet transport, you can define additional interfaces, T1, OC3, uh, RS232, any one of those. And you define each service, you test it, you make sure it works, and basically you swing over the services from the Sonnet Max you know, during maintenance window at your own leisure. But once that is done, basically the Sonnet Max has no more functionality and you can decommission it. And at that point, uh, the migration is fully done. So that's basically, in a nutshell, the, the, the movement, the connection. Of course, there's different things that you need to consider as part of that movement, uh, things like you know, uh, services, latency, technology, and so on. And we're going to get into that one. So talking about latency. So latency has mainly three things that you need to look at. There's the constant part, which is the propagation delay. Okay, uh, mainly it's the fiber. You're looking at five microseconds per kilometer. That's physics. Uh, it's very hard to, you know, change the speed of light. People tried it for a very long time, but still we're stuck with, you know, the physics part of it. Um, the propagation through a hope that depends, of course, on the technology that you have. Usually they're about 100 microseconds 
uh, with the newer technology, basically, you know, a 10 gig or 100 gig coming in, going out. The other two parts that are more controllable um, is the jitter buffer on the RX side, usually, uh, in order to provide, to minimize what we call uh, um, packet delay variation, which is basically translating to jitter. And that affects, especially if you're working in a ring environment um, and you have a short leg and a long leg or in a more advanced uh, mesh network, that's something that you need to tune in order to make sure that um, all packets come within a predefined um, latency in order to be able to still provide that constant bit rate on the other end. And of course, uh, the main uh, aspect of that one is the payload time. And I'm going to go into details about that one. And that's one of the main recommendations that I usually provide to customer is payload time is the easiest one to control and the most predictable one. So um, we're going to go into that one. And of course, later on, we're going to look at the technology, uh, which transport technology cover based the service need. You can have different services de requiring different KPIs and different technology can attend that one uh, better. So if we're looking at the, you know, the latency because of the payload time, um, as you can see this in this table, I was trying to show, uh, you know, the payload time of an OC3 or OC192 compared to the new generation of, you know, 100 gig, uh, sorry, 400 gig all the way down to 100 uh, Mbps. And as you notice, the higher the rate is, the actually time to create the frame and transmit it through the medium is shorter. I mean, basically you're transmitting more bits per second, hence the latency of that payload is much shorter. And the thumb rule that I recommend to most of you know the customer that are looking at it is whatever you use now, you want something at least 10 times faster. Um, I heard a lot of customers saying like, I would never need anything that fast. And two years later, they come back and go like, yes, I need something faster than that. So might as well make that leap at the initial stage and get something that can go, you know, 100 gig, 400 gig. You'd be, you know, inserting lower latency and at the same time have more capacity for the future. And the price differences are usually not that big. I mean, between one gig uplink and a 10 gig uplink, the, 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 you know, uh, on a standard fiber, the cost is minimal, uh, 10 to 100, there's a little bit of a cost, but not that big. And 100 to 400, as we've seen today, they're getting closer and closer each time. So the faster you can go, the more future-proof the network is. So that's regarding the latency. So we talked about um, uh, the payload time, the latency, uh, the connection. The next one that we want to address is the technology. So different type of technology have different type of inherited feature set. So if you look at, at the Sonnet side here, and each one of them, if you look and compare, um, the more pluses, the better it is. If you, have an, uh, if you have a minus, that means it's not capable of doing that one. But there's different technology which address the migration, and each one of them has different feature set, anything from time to switch over anything between um, you know latency deterministic performance and so on and because um, TDM inherently as I said is a constant bitrate or a CBR the more that the traffic can be engineered or control or get to a deterministic performance the better for the sonnet performance it's going to be so it's kind of funny. We're taking a technology that was supposed to totally take something that was a constant bitrate, make it statistically multiplexed, and now we're giving it the tool to actually go back into a constant bitrate and deterministic performance. Um, but again, that's what happens when you try to run legacy services still over your uh, new generation network. So there's different type of things, and each one of them has the plus and minuses. What's the recommended one? It depends on your services, depends on the functions, and each one of them can be addressing a different type of uh, service or need. So with all that, um, I'm going to you know, jump to the next section and 
uh, figure out if there's any questions. So if we're looking at a traditional utility for anything that's um, time sensitive and performance sensitive, still static MPLS provides uh, the best solution. MPLS TP, transport profile, not TE. Anything that's more um, dynamic in nature, okay? Um, MP, IP MPLS with RSVP TE or without depends if the if there's no issue with latency, there's no issue with jitter, then our, you know that's a solution. SRTE segment routing with traffic engineering, you know that's something. It's still not very populated on the OT sides. On the IT sides, it's very popular. Um, and again, there's other features that are supposed to be there, but they're still in draft mode. They're still not proven. The best is if you can get a platform that does all of that one, so you can assign a different uh, technology to different services, and that will provide you, you know, the best solution, and you can address the different uh, feature set based on your topology and SLAs. One of the things that Sonnet actually provided very well was the protection, the under 50 millisecond switching time that actually kind of echoed and propagated to new generation network. And that is still kind of considered the, you know, the, the, the de facto standard of uh, protection. Now, in addition to that, because some of the TDM services um, are very sensitive to switching time, even 50 milliseconds, uh, may create an issue if you're losing the information during a switching time. So some of the new generation platforms can provide that they combine basically uh, the circuit emulation 1 plus 1 and the APS plus plus 1 to create uh, a zero, uh, basically a zero switching time. How that it's achieved by simply send using uh, the standard APS 1 plus 1 when you transmit the same information on both the working and protect path. And at that point, the end device gets the same information from two sources, and it can select the first packet that arrives in as long as it, there's no errors in it. This way, there's always packets coming in. Of course, you have to, you know, if the path is different, you have to adjust your um, your jitter buffers in order to make that, get the latency as close as possible. But at that point, there's no switching time because the system will get two packets. Uh, one that is going to discard and one that is going to use. Uh, and because of that, there's technically zero millisecond switching time. Packets are always forwarded. The downside of that one is you actually have two active links all the time. So it takes more bandwidth, but it, it basically guarantees zero millisecond switching time, and it gives you um, no, no packet loss uh, in this state. Um, so that regarding the protection, more advanced protection scheme um, on the Ethernet side or on the LAN side uh, will be covered uh, by Jack on the second part of this session. So overall, um, there's different type of solution for the migration. There's different type of interfaces that are needed. Anything from you know an OC48 or even an OC192 all the way down to a DS1 or the subrate. Uh, there's new functions that those network needs. Uh, things like um, Ethernet connectivity with you know power over Ethernet um, with high capacity, um, you know 400 gig and so on. That requires the modernization of those network and provide additional services in parallel to the old generation one. All of those things together can be provided uh, as you select the right technology, the right migration path, and the right feature set. Um, and at the end of the day, different vendors can provide a different way. And we are here to provide you a solution uh, tailored to what you need. Uh, with this, I conclude my part of the uh, demonstration. Um, Jack, it's back to you. Thanks, Bruno. Good stuff. Okay, we're going to uh, kind of branch off and talk specifically about network survivability. Um, 
and uh, let's go ahead and roll it. Bruno, I'm going to be asking you to advance the slides if you don't mind. So next slide. So everybody's familiar with the medieval castle. Let's just kind of break it down real quick. Uh, the, the good stuff, the treasure and so forth is right in the middle of that, of that structure. Um, what did they do to protect themselves and their treasure? Well, they put multiple, uh, uh, multiple methods in place to prevent the bad guys from getting inside. Uh, the, you know, there's a central keep in the middle. There's a curtain wall in the middle. There's a wall on the outside of that. There's a moat on the outside of that, uh, obviously drawbridges. And then you've got soldiers and archers and all sorts of things uh, on the walls. And so uh, this is uh, a, a really simple example of what we think of as defense in depth. Uh, defense in depth essentially means that you are not putting all of your eggs in one basket or you're not using one method uh, to protect what's valuable to you. Um, uh, it's much easier to defeat one of these uh, than it is to defeat one after another after another uh, to get to uh, to get to the valuables. Uh, you know, in the modern world, uh, in your enterprise, uh, you have locked doors, you have fences, uh, you've got video cameras, uh, uh, backup power, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right? All of these things are part of a defense strategy or a security strategy. Um, uh, let's extend that to the inside of the network. Next slide. So uh, you're looking to protect uh, your infrastructure. That's how you that's how your revenue is is generated. Uh, and so we need to extend that security mindset to the inside of the network. Right. Uh, and networks are uh, a conglomeration of multiple technologies, each of which is specialized to do one thing really well. Uh, in a typical broadband type network, uh, you've got uh, an optical layer, uh, otherwise known as DWDM, but there are other ways to do it. But it's basically just layer one transport pipes. Uh, above that, you've got switches, you've got routers, uh, and then, of course, a management system. Well, each of these needs to be secured in its own way. Uh, uh, and so we need to take a look at what does that security structure look like uh, from, uh, from a layer-by-layer -layer perspective, right? So let's uh, go to the next slide. So let's start with layer one, right? So this is, uh, we, we used to call these dumb pipes um, uh, simply because what they did was whatever you put into them is what came out on the other end. There was very little uh, traffic engineering or, or uh, container manipulation inside. You're just making uh, data go as fast as it possibly can from point A to point B. Uh, DWDM in a way is uh, is a way to segment traffic. Again, we're trying to diversify the pipes that we're sending data across, right? Just like you want to diversify your retirement savings. You don't put everything into bonds or everything into gold or Bitcoin or anything else. Every, every advisor in the world is going to tell you to diversify those to lower your risk. I'm going to suggest the same thing within your network environment. So uh, with uh, DWDM, for those of you that are not familiar with this technology, it allows us to run multiple wavelengths over a single pair of fiber. In, instead of burning a new pair of fiber for every service that I want to run, I can run multiple wavelengths uh, and use that same pair of fiber. So. Uh, Bruno, if you'll advance the, the slide a couple of times. So, so this is uh, an example of running uh, one wavelength, also known as a lambda. Uh, and that could be entirely for customer A, and that might be 100 gig. Lambda 2 could be for your healthcare uh, customers. Uh, or uh, other customers that demand additional security. And so you can encrypt that 
uh, that particular wavelength. Uh, Lambda three could be another customer, and Lambda four is open for the next uh, for the next customer, or perhaps uh, for multiple customers. So, in this way, we're able to discreetly uh, and administratively separate people's traffic because each of these wavelengths uh, has no connection or interference with any other wavelength on that uh, pair of fiber. So, it is a way to to do what's called a soft slice of your network, uh, to seg segment traffic out uh, and separate it from each other, right? Each one of these also depends upon a different laser to send that wavelength down the line. And so if you burn one, if one laser goes out, you've got multiple other lasers that are sending traffic. So again, you're diversifying and lowering your overall risk. Uh, the other thing that you can do on the on layer one is implement some type of uh, 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 fiber health managing or signal health managing. So what this means is monitoring that will uh, look at your transmit, your receive, your uh, signal to noise ratios, and so forth. All of the vital signs of a DWDM network can be monitored uh, and then alarmed. So at any one point, if a sig starts degrading, you can get in there and uh, and do some preventive maintenance. Uh, from a fiber health standpoint, uh, the technology certainly exists today uh, to put OTDR uh, built into your uh, fiber plant so that you do not have to rely on handheld OTDRs anymore. You don't have to call somebody out of bed in the middle of the night to run out there and do an OTDR shot. You can literally do it from your desktop anywhere in the network automatically. Uh, further, you can have it set so that if it detects a loss of signal, a fiber break, for instance, uh, that it will do an OTDR shot automatically. It will send out a message to those on the list. Uh, that need to get those messages that says, hey, you've got a break uh, at a, this exact spot on the fiber, right? Uh, this obviously doesn't prevent breaks. We haven't created a, a backhoe proof fiber sheath yet, um, but it does give you the ability to get in there and start remediation uh, much, much faster. Uh, you know, within five minutes, you know exactly where that break is uh, and you can dispatch that splice truck. Uh, so the other thing that uh, used to be fairly common uh, before higher level protocols uh, were developed uh, for this purpose was an optical protection switch. So this is a piece of hardware that sits on the line side of your DWDM solution. So let's say you have a working path and a protect path, right? So you have two ways to get from A to B. Uh, this optical protection switch will monitor the light on your working path. And if it goes out, it will begin the switch over and then eventually switch all your traffic over to the protect path. So uh, it, it works very simply on detecting that light loss. So this, this is obviously a valuable thing. However, it's generally, uh, while very reliable, it is not as fast as we would like it to be. You know, the standard back from the Sonnet days was that we switch traffic sub 50 milliseconds. Uh, and this comes simply from the fact that if you switch over sub 50 milliseconds, generally human beings are not going to be able to tell that a switch over has taken place, right? Either on a phone call or video and so forth. Data, of course, is much more resilient to that. But that's that's where the sub 50 millisecond uh uh, threshold came from. And so we apply that to all new technologies going forward. It came from Sonnet, but but that is the benchmark, right? We have to achieve that. Uh, and optical protection switching, uh, generally speaking, cannot achieve that level of speedy switchover. So while it is reliable and it does switch things over, um, the, the switchover is going to be detectable to a human recipient. Next, uh, next slide. 
So let's move up the stack. So we've covered layer one and, and the value that you can derive for your network resiliency from layer one. Let's like look at layer two. So layer two, also known as the switching layer, has a number of technologies that have been developed over the years uh, that allow us to uh, take traffic from a working to a protect, right? Again, it's gonna require two paths um, and it's gonna give us the ability to detect a fault uh, down the working path and then switch over to the protect path, uh, which in general has already been nailed up and is just waiting uh, in uh, sort of like president, vice president, right? The, the protect path has already been configured and, and simply waits to be used uh, in the event of emergency. So multi-chassis lag is, is one method of, uh, of uh, providing this type of service. This essentially gives you a connection to two different chassis uh, that perf and each of those chassis, each of those devices, switches uh, uh, or routers uh, are performing the same task, right? So you have a single device that perhaps your customer is, is uh, attached to and that device connects to, it has two ways of egress, right? And so if one of them fails, it, it flops over to the other one, right? So this, is, this has been a very common, and today is still a very common, uh, uh, commonly deployed protocol. Um, it, it uses that same basic method, right? I've got uh, a primary and I've got a backup path, right? There are better technologies than this out today, but, but I would venture to say that, that uh, there are many, many multi-chassis lag solutions out there today. And... And, uh, and obviously they're working just fine. Uh, another technology that was very popular uh, 10 or so years ago and today still is popular in the access uh, where your PON devices are and so forth. And that's G.8032. It has two different versions now, version one and version two. This is also known as Ethernet ring protection uh, or ERPS. Um, uh, it, it is an older technology, but but it is fairly reliable, um, uh, and we'll talk about how that that works specifically in the next slide. Uh, but uh, you're you're liable to see this again in the access. Um, it is not used so much in middle mile or uh, or in in the core. Uh, it, it is uh, an older technology that's been superseded by by better better protocols, better technology. One of those better technologies is MPLS TP, uh, very widely deployed. This was the uh, the default method of building broadband network protection uh, for many, many years, um, uh, up until, say, three or four years ago. And there are still many, many MPLS TP networks out there. It's utterly reliable. Uh, I, you see, if you're not familiar with it, you see the MPLS uh, uh, letters, right, or acronym there. Um, it is um, more of a subset of MPLS, and then it also adds a few things. Uh, this is not full IP MPLS. Uh, it is a subset uh, really specifically designed for protection, right? Uh, and then looking at the diagram, what I want you to take away from 8032 and MPLS TP, which we'll reiterate in the next couple of slides, is that uh, these are really built for ring technologies. Right. So that's great if you've got a ring fiber tech uh, uh, topology, but that's not the only type of fiber that that we are putting in place and have put in place. There are linear networks, stub networks, uh, partial mesh, full mesh networks. Uh, these technologies really aren't as sophisticated uh, to support those. Um, 8032 V2 does have the concept of sub rings. Uh, and, uh, and more complex technologies, but, um, but it starts to get fairly clunky in terms of configuration uh, and predictive behavior. You know, you really want a deterministic path for your behavior, uh, for your traffic behavior, uh, so that you know exactly what's going to happen in the event of a failure, because it's very difficult to predict failures and exactly what's going to happen. Next page. <clears throat> so 8032, again, this is a fairly old technology, but 
again, it, it is also very reliable and, and you do see it in that access layer. So essentially what you see here is uh, I have a ring of nodes here that runs from uh, in a clockwise fashion, A to F, and then back to A. So essentially what happens in an 8032 network is uh, one segment of that network, one span of that network is chosen to be the ring protection link or the RPL. Uh, and then the, there, there is uh, uh, a, a node that is designated as the RPL owner, right? So uh, in this case, F, uh, node F is going to be my RPL owner. And what it's going to do is administratively turn that link down. So that's going to help me prevent uh, forwarding loops, right? Because uh, that's that's not what we want. We don't want traffic that is going to go to uh, another node to end up coming from A and end up back at A again, right? Um, so we're going to turn that link between F and A down administratively. And that is that turns my network into a linear, right? So now I'm going to forward traffic. If I'm running traffic from A to F, it's going to go A, B, C, D, E, and then on to F, okay? Uh, and then it's going to send keep alives every 10 milliseconds. Uh, and when those, uh, when you miss by default, if you miss three keep alives, uh, excuse me, three, three milliseconds. So after three keep alives are missed, you've, you've got about 10 milliseconds there. Um, a fault is declared somewhere, right? So let's say the fault is perhaps between B and C. So the keep alives are going to, we're going to miss three keep alives. A fault is going to be declared between B and C. B is going to say, I can't see C anymore. C is going to say the same thing. I was connected to B and I am no longer connected to B. That is going to trigger F to open up that ring protection link. And so now F and A are directly connected again. And at that point, my network goes from A, B, C, D, E, F to A over to B and then A to F, E, D, and C because I can no longer get between B and C, right? So the, the benefits here are it's fairly easy to use. Uh, you're, you're, all you have to do is, is uh, block out that one, uh, that one protection link, ring protection link. Um, it already knows all the nodes know the their position in the ring and who they're directly connected to uh, and when a fault is declared it starts uh, at the 10 millisecond line uh, and then it starts switching traffic over so generally uh, unless you've really overburdened this uh, this instance of of 8032 you're going to get sub 50 millisecond failover because traffic will just reverse and go the other way right very straightforward. Uh, you, you can either have it revert if uh, B and C comes back up again, uh, then you can have it revert automatically and have F to A shut down, or you can wait for human intervention, right? Humans can come in and take a look at it and decide uh, where that ring protection link needs to be, right? So very straightforward. Um, 8032 V1 was implemented generally in a uh, a proprietary manner. There wasn't a whole lot of, of cooperation between vendors. 8032 V2 was rolled out for more advanced tech, uh, topologies uh, and with more of an interoperability uh, uh, mindset. However, there's always going to be some tweaking for interop, and but that's just that's just that's sort of par for the course, really, regardless of of what you're looking for. So, uh, so this is 8032 today. Again, you're going to see it in the access, not used so much in a uh, in the middle mile or in the core. Next slide. So we went to MPLS TP, TP after this. Again, we're we're at the layer two switching level, right? MPLS TP, in a nutshell, uh, creates working and protect paths. So using my diagram here, we're going from A to D, uh, and so my working path is A F E D. Uh, and my protect path, which is already configured uh, with exactly the same parameters as my working path. The protect path is A, B, C, D, okay? And it's just waiting 
uh, in the in the wings, right? Waiting in the wings for the signal to start carrying traffic. So uh, upon a fault, all the traffic immediately switches over from working to protect, right? And again, you can have either human intervention to switch back, fail over, or fail back, uh, or you can have it uh, uh, wait for a, a holdout timer, uh, test the formerly bad circuit, and if it comes up again, you can switch traffic back, right? This is very easy to use. It's deterministic, which means I know exactly the path that my traffic is going to follow um, in either a working or a protect fashion. So you can see why this was so popular, right? It's much easier to deploy. Um, it's utterly reliable. It's sub 50 milliseconds um, and, and it's a great way to go. Uh, the, the, the downside to it is that it, it's really just a ring technology, right? Um, it requires two paths. Uh, it also requires that you hold the bandwidth on your protect path um, in suspension, right? You can't use it because it, it in the event of a failure, it's going to flop over, right? So you're getting 50% of the usage out of your network. Now, that may not be an issue if you've got a DWDM network with, you know, virtually unlimited capacity, but uh, it, it does, it, it is a consideration, right? That that uh, that protect path can't be used uh, while it is uh, waiting for, you know, an emergency. So MPLS TP, still valid technology today. There are certainly uh, applications where this is valid. Um, it can be used uh, not so much in the access, primarily because I don't think the access vendors uh, support this. Uh, in the middle mile, um, it, it's very common in, in the middle mile. Uh, and, and probably if you're going to go with a layer two technology, uh, this is probably the best one to, to go for. All right, next slide. Mm. So we've seen a sea change in the past few years. Um, uh, moving from the traditional and really default method of building broadband networks, uh, which is the layer two uh, uh, MPLS TP or Ethernet ring protection that I just showed you, um, and moving towards uh, a layer three routed uh, uh, solution. So there's really two big reasons for this. One is, is economic. Um, routing is much cheaper than it used to be. Uh, you know, routing for the masses, the, the scale, uh, the, the economies of scale have really uh, allowed routing chipsets uh, to become much cheaper and ubiquitous for, uh, you know, and there are also multiple vendors out there, uh, which always is good for the end customer uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of competition, right? So the cost has come down. Uh, 10 years ago, if you had told somebody, I'm going to build a broadband network and I'm going to do it with all routers, they would have thought you were either made of money or crazy, right? Because routers were just prohibitively expensive. Uh, you, you couldn't make that work uh, in, in most situations. And that's why we went with layer two switching because switching is much cheaper, right? So prices have come down. Optics prices have come down. Um, and, uh, and that has really contributed to it. The other is that there has been a, a lot of really positive development in the industry across vendors, uh, cooperatively and individually, to develop protocols that, uh, that, while perhaps weren't specifically designed for the modern broadband network, certainly enable it and, and allow us to provide services in the middle mile, uh, which are uh, uh, much higher value, uh, much higher touch, uh, much more customized for the end customer um, uh, and a better quality of experience for them. One of these technologies is segment routing and then uh, an addition to that segment routing traffic engineering. Um, it allows much more rapid decision making uh, in terms of, uh, of traffic forwarding and routing. So let me stop for a moment and and kind of define some terms. So IP routing uh, and IP MPLS have been with us for a long time, right? And this is, uh, for those of you not real familiar with this, uh, in a nutshell, this is uh, routing devices 
that speak at, at the layer three routing level, and they determine a map of what the network looks like and the best, best path based upon their, their chosen metrics uh, to forward traffic, depending on what that path is. And that path can change from moment to moment. So this is why routers are more expensive generally than switches, is that they are generally non-deterministic, meaning that I don't really know what path I'm going to be taking. I just know it's the best path based upon the metrics that I've given it. Think of your GPS uh, traffic app on your phone, right? At any moment, as you are driving down the highway, a wreck can occur and it will route you off the highway and it'll take you perhaps on a county road uh, and then around. Now, normally that's not the fastest path. The fastest path is down the highway at 75 or 80 miles an hour. But if there's a wreck and you're just gonna stop there or move very slowly through that area, then the fastest path has now become an alternate. That's how routers work. Routers uh, monitor the network repetitively and on the fly dynamically choose what the best path is, right? Well, so there are many different routing protocols and many different metrics that can be used for this. And we're always working on this and improving this, right? Segment routing is one such improvement um, where it uses uh, the concept of segments instead of individual, uh, uh, individual labels to forward traffic. It allows routers to make much faster decisions um, and, uh, and much, much higher quality decisions, right? Also provides a much greater degree uh, of control over where your traffic's going to go, uh, particularly your high value customers, the ones who you want to maintain that stickiness with uh, and, uh, uh, and maintain their quality of experience so that they happily pay their bills month after month after month, right? It also, just like other routing protocols, it automatically adapts to changing conditions. Uh, this is really kind of a core concept of, of routing, right? Um, the tunnel technology that, that, is, uh, that is being used uh, uh, very frequently is TILFA, uh, 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 topo independent, topology independent, loop-free alternate. Uh, or loop-free uh, alternative, right? The, the bottom line here uh, is that it is being calculated by uh, your uh, one of your routing protocols, right? Your interior gateway protocol. Uh, and, and so it is kept apprised of, uh, uh, of the latest conditions of the network and can initiate a failover uh, uh, generally in sub 50 milliseconds. Right. So there are a number of advantages here. Right. One is, is that I can use this in virtually any topology. Right. Uh, I can do it. I can certainly use it on rings. Um, but if all I have a ring is a ring, then uh, then it's not going to switch over any faster than, say, MPLS TP. What it will do is give me higher touch, higher, uh, a better connectivity, excuse me, better uh uh, control over my high value uh, services, right? Uh, more granular control. Uh, the uh, EVPN is uh, another technology that has come about uh, that is uh, quickly gaining acceptance and, uh, and approval uh, that essentially allows us, it does a lot of what multi-chassis lag did and does, right? Uh, except in uh, various modes, it allows you to run active and active. Um, so this generally lag type technologies uh, and other uh, redundant router technologies are uh, active and passive, right? Or active and standby. Uh, EVPN can be configured to run both active and active uh, and load sharing, right? So there's an advantage there. Um, Okay, so let's uh, go to the next slide. Uh, here's an example of an EVPN customer deployment where I have an access uh, device. Uh, so this may be a PON device um, uh, or a, a, a layer two switch that has aggregated PON. Uh, and then it needs to connect to the backbone. So I've got routers in the backbone uh, and then I've got aggregation devices 
uh, uh, here in blue, right? So what I want to do is uh, give each of these, uh, just like my multi-chassis lag uh, 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 description early in the presentation, I want to give these uh, devices two ways to get to the backbone, right? To increase my resiliency and lower my risk of dropping traffic. Um, so with an older technology, this is going to be more of an active and then a standby, right? So my standby path won't get used. With eVPN, I can configure that for active and active traffic flow so that not only do I have two paths out to the backbone, uh, but I can, uh, I can load share across that, right? So full usage of your links, and it gives you that survivability. Next slide. Uh, so when we are talking about survivability and resilience, kind of stepping uh, back up to, uh, uh, to a higher level here, uh, there are a number of technologies that are out there in the marketplace uh, that can be considered part of your survivability or your defense in depth, right? Certainly security is really kind of the one that everybody thinks about, right? Uh, and so proper authentication for users on your network, um, you know, using proper protocols to access um, uh, whether it's uh, client based or or cloud based, web based uh, encryption technologies and so forth. But but don't overlook uh, the methods of traffic protection um, uh, as well as uh, as various uh, uh, traffic uh, discrimination, right? Ways to separate traffic uh, and keep your customers separated um, uh, and so forth, right? So all of these can be considered as a part of and should be considered a, a part of your resiliency strategy. Next slide. And that's what we have for you today from both Bruno and myself. Uh, we have uh, a few minutes for questions. Um, and uh, we'd be happy to entertain those now. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Jack. Thanks, Bruno. We had a couple questions come in and we still have plenty of time. So um, obviously, if you look below the slides, you'll see a section there where you can type in your question. So while we're going through these first couple, um, please ask us your questions while we have the time. So question number one, um, do I have to use one technology for all of my services uh, on the specific device? Um, I'll take that one if you don't mind. Um, so not necessarily. Again, it depends on who are you going to use, whose uh, who's, uh, platform are you going to use. Um, for example, the platform that we provide at Ribbon, on the same platform, you can run uh, IPMPLS, MPLSTP, you know, carry Ethernet, segment routing. So you assign, based on the KPI of each services, the right technology for it. So you can have, you know, something that needs to have deterministic performances like teleprotection run over MPLSTP. Something that's more dynamic, you can run over TLFA. Something that, you know, can run just standard MPLS for standard IT traffic. So it gives you the capability to select the most uh, compliant technology with the service that you're actually trying to deploy. Very good. Okay. Um, and then we had one other question here. Um, I get that there are multiple ways to protect traffic, but which one is best? Like why pick one uh, way over another way? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, as with any network design, it, it's gonna depend on, on what your topology looks like and what traffic you're trying to protect. Um, as I mentioned a couple of times during the presentation, uh, you know, the layer two technologies are generally designed, were generally designed for rings. Um, virtually everyone's got rings uh, in their legacy and, and even, you know, obviously produ production uh, fiber topology because that's what we built Sonnet on, right? Sonnet was based on rings. So when we built fiber over the last 20 years, we generally put it into rings. Um, it's also a very handy technology uh, or a handy topology because it gives uh, two methods of egress for every node, right? So uh, so uh, if that's what you have, um, 
then uh, obviously you can use that layer two technology if that, uh, and it'll work just fine for you if all you want to do is is protect your traffic. Now that's a that's an important consideration as you as obviously you realize, uh, but newer technologies are allowing us not only to protect our traffic in more advanced uh, uh, topologies, right? So allowing you to build, say, a partial mesh or a full mesh network. What, what this means, if you're not familiar with that term, is instead of a ring, look, consider a ring. And then in addition to that ring, I'm, I'm connecting uh, nodes on the ring directly to each other, right? Uh, instead of just their neighbors to the east and the west, right? So, so almost like a dream catcher, right? The sort of woven thing that people hang from their rearview mirrors, right? So think of that as your network, right? So with that type of environment, um, you have many more methods of traffic egress and ingress for each node. And you want to be able to take advantage of that. The other advantage that I didn't really mention, but is is a consideration. Um, you saw Bruno's table that talked about the latency that exists while we are waiting on the light to transit the glass fiber, right? We literally are waiting on the speed of light in some cases for, um, for traffic to reach the next node. Well, if I have a full mesh or a partial mesh network, then it can literally be a, a, a very significant time savings to have additional paths, shortcuts, if you will, through that network, right? So, uh, so I am I have multiple paths to get out. Some of them are going to be shorter, uh, even if it's measured in microseconds. There are people who measure in microseconds when they are moving their traffic. Think of uh, high frequency traders. Um, so, so all of that. Uh, it is is part of how the, the technology is moving forward um, with the FedGov funding that is that is coming down the pike uh, in the next few years. Uh, there are there are plans for I would venture to guess hundreds of thousands of miles of new fiber to be trenched, and a lot of that's going to be in partial mesh and full mesh networks for just that reason, uh, and that's why going to a layer three technology has become so popular. Um, you know, segment routing is where we are today. Segment routing with traffic engineering extensions um, is, uh, is, I think, where the industry is going. So hopefully that answers the question. As a typical engineer, right, I'm going to tell you which one's best. It depends, right? But these are the, this is the way the industry is going. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. All right, Jack. Well, you know, and Bruno, with respect to time being a little bit over the hour, uh, we'll go ahead and conclude things here today. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their attendance. Uh, thank you, obviously, Bruno and Jack, for your presentations. Uh, you'll be receiving an email later this afternoon with a link to the replay so you can rewatch all this and hear all this great material. And of course, if you have questions, you can obviously reply to that email. I have Elizabeth Page's contact information on screen now, so you want to take a note of that if you'd like. We'll have a, a link to the replay. We'll have a link to the slides. And um, as always, we're here to help with any of these questions as they, as they come about. Thanks again for your time. We'll see you on the next webinar. Talk soon. Thanks all.